Hello everyone. Today in Anatomy Weekly, we are going to talk about another bone which is a part of the shoulder girdle. This bone is the shoulder blade or the scapula. So let's get started. The scapula or the shoulder blade is a large flattened and triangular bone located on the upper part of the posterior lateral aspect of the thorax against the second to seventh ribs. The parts of the scapula are as follows. The scapula is highly mobile and consists of four parts, a body and three processes, a spinous process, an acromion and a coracoid process. Now when we come to the body, we can see that the body of the scapula is triangular, it is thin and transparent and it presents the following features. The two surfaces costal and the dorsal. Three borders, the superior border, the lateral border and the medial border and three angles that is the inferior angle, the superior angle and the lateral angle. The dorsal surface presents a shelf like projection on its upper part called the spinous process. The lateral angle is truncated to form an articular surface that is known as the glenoid cavity. The lateral angle is thickened and is called the head of the scapula which is connected to the plate like body by a neck which you can see over here. Coming to the processes of the bone, there are three processes. These are as follows. Number one, the spinous process. Number two, the acromion process. And number three, the coracoid process. The spinous process is a shelf like bony projection on the dorsal aspect of the body. The acromion process projects forwards almost at right angles from the lateral end of the spine itself. The coracoid process is like a bird's beak. It arises from the upper border of the head and bends sharply to project supero anteriorly. Coming to the anatomical position and side determination of the bone. The side of the scapula can be determined by holding the scapula in such a way that the glenoid cavity faces laterally, forwards and slightly upwards at an angle almost 45 degree from the coronal plane. Number two, the coracoid process is directed forwards and number three, the shelf like spinous process is directed posteriorly. Keeping all these points in mind, we can see that this scapula belongs to the left side. Coming to the features and the attachments, let us first see the surfaces. The costal surface, also known as the subscapular fossa, is concave and directed medially and forwards. It presents three longitudinal ridges which provides attachment to the intramuscular tendons of subscapularis muscle. This muscle, the subscapularis, is a multipinnate muscle and it arises from the medial two-third of scapular fossa, costal surface, except near the neck where a subscapular bursa intervenes between the neck and the subscapular tendon. The serratus anterior muscle is inserted on this very surface along the medial border and the inferior angle. Coming to the dorsal surface of the bone, the dorsal surface is convex and presents a shelf like projection called the spinous process. The spinous process essentially divides the dorsal surface into the supraspinous and the infraspinous fossa. The upper supraspinous fossa is smaller and the lower infraspinous fossa is larger. The spinoglenoid notch lies between the lateral border of the spinous process and the dorsal surface 
of the neck of the scapula. Through this notch, the supraspinous fossa communicates with the infraspinous fossa and the suprascapular nerves and vessels pass from the supraspinous fossa to the infraspinous fossa. The supraspinatus muscle arises from the medial two-third of the supraspinous fossa. The infraspinatus muscle arises from the medial two-third of the infraspinous fossa. The teres minor muscle arises from the upper two-third of the dorsal surface in the lateral border. This origin is interrupted by the circumflex scapular artery. The teres major muscle arises from the lower one-third of the dorsal surface in the lateral border and the inferior angle of the scapula. The latissimus dorsae muscle arises from the dorsal surface of the inferior angle by a small flip. The superior border is the shortest border and extends between superior and the lateral angles. The suprascopular notch is present on this border near the root of the coracoid process. This notch, that is the suprascapular notch, is converted into a suprascapular foramen by the superior transverse or the suprascapular ligament. The suprascapular artery passes above the ligament and the suprascapular nerve passes below the ligament through the suprascapular foramen. The inferior belly of omohyoid arises from the superior border near the suprascapular notch. Now coming to the lateral border, the lateral border is the thickest border and extends from the inferior angle to the glenoid cavity. The infraglenoid tubercle is present at its upper end just below the glenoid cavity. The long head of tricep muscle arises from the infraglenoid tubercle. Coming to the medial border of the bone, the medial border is also called the vertebral border. It extends from the superior angle to the inferior angle. This border is thinned and it is angled at the root of the spine. The serratus anterior muscle is inserted on the costal surface of the medial border and the inferior angle of the bone. The levator scapulae muscle is inserted on the dorsal aspect of the medial border from the superior angle to the root of the spine. The rhomboidus minor muscle is inserted on the dorsal aspect of the medial border opposite to the root of the spine while the rhomboidus major muscle is inserted on the dorsal aspect of the medial border from the root of the spine to the inferior angle. Next, let us talk about the angles of the scapula. The inferior angle lies over the seventh rib or the seventh intercostal space. The superior angle is at the junction of the superior and the medial border and it lies over the second rib. The lateral angle or the head of the scapula is truncated and bears a pear-shaped articular cavity called the glenoid cavity. This glenoid cavity articulates with the head of the humerus to form the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. A fibrocartilaginous rim or the glenoid labrum is attached to the margins of the glenoid cavity to deepen its concavity. The capsule of the soldier joint is attached to the margins of the glenoid cavity proximal to the attachment of the glenoid labrum. The long head of the biceps brachii arises from a tubercle called the supraglenoid tubercle. This origin of the long head of biceps is intracapsular. Moving on to the processes, the spinous process or the spine of the scapula is a triangular shelf-like bony projection attached to the dorsal surface of the scapula at the junction of its upper one-third and the lower two-third. It divides the dorsal surface of the scapula into two parts, upper supraspinous fossa and the lower infraspinous fossa. The spine has two surfaces a superior and an inferior and three borders, anterior, posterior and a lateral border. 
if we see the surfaces of the spine the superior surface of the spine forms the lower boundary of the supraspinous fossa and gives origin to the supraspinatus muscle the inferior surface of the spine forms the upper limit of the infraspinous fossa and gives origin to the infraspinatus muscle the anterior border of the spine is attached to the dorsal surface of the scapula the lateral border of the spine bounds the spinoglenoid notch through which passes the suprascapular nerve and vessels from the supraspinous fossa to the infraspinous fossa as we have described earlier the posterior border of the spine is also called the crest of the spine the muscle trapezius is inserted to the upper lip of the crest of the spine while the posterior fibers of the deltoid muscle takes origin from its lower lip let us talk about the acromion process the acromion process projects forwards almost at right angles from the lateral end of the spine and it overhangs the glenoid cavity its superior surface is subcutaneous it has a tip two borders which is the medial border and the lateral border and two surfaces the superior surface and the inferior surface the medial and the lateral border of the acromion continues with the upper and the lower lip of the crest of the spine of the scapula respectively its superior surface is rough and subcutaneous the inferior surface is smooth and it is related to the subacromial bursa the medial border of the acromion provides insertion to the trapezius muscle near the tip the medial border presents a circular facet and this circular facet articulates with the lateral end of the clavicle to form the acromioclavicular joint the lateral border gives origin to the intermediate fibers of the deltoid muscle the coracoacromial ligament is attached to the tip of the acromion the acromial angle is at the junction of the lateral border of the acromion and the lateral border of the crest of the spine of the scapula coming to the coracoid process it arises from the upper part of the head of the scapula and is bent sharply so that it projects forwards and slightly laterally coming to the coracoid process of the scapula it arises from the upper part of the head of the scapula and is bent sharply so that it projects forwards and slightly laterally the coracoid process provides attachment to three muscles the short head of biceps brachii the coracobrachialis and the pectoralis minor and it gives attachment to three ligaments the coracoacromial ligament the coracoclavicular ligament and the coracohumeral ligament the short head of biceps brachii and the coracobrachialis arises from its tip by a common tendon the pectoralis minor muscle is inserted on the medial part of the upper surface the coracoacromial ligament is attached to the lateral border and this part also gives attachment to the conoid and the trapezoid parts of the coracoclavicular ligaments to understand the coracoclavicular ligament you can go back to our lesson on the clavicle the coracohumeral ligament is attached to the root of the coracoid process near the glenoid cavity in living individuals the tip of the coracoid process can be palpated 2.5 cm below the junction of the lateral 1/4 and the medial 3/4 of the clavicle another point is that in reptiles the coracoid process is a separate bone but in humans it is attached to the scapula and thus it represents atavistic epiphysis to know about the atavistic epiphysis in details you can go back to our previous episode 
on the general anatomy of bone and you can have a look into it. Moving to the ossification, the ossification of the scapula is cartilaginous. The cartilaginous scapula is ossified by 8 centers, 1 primary center and 7 secondary centers. The primary center appears in the body, the secondary center appears as follows. Two center appear in the coracoid process. Two center appear in the acromion process. One center appears each in the medial border, the inferior angle and in the lower part of the rim of the glenoid cavity. The primary center in the body and the first secondary center in the coracoid process appears in eight week of the interuterine life and first year of the postnatal life respectively and they fuse at the age of 15 years. All other secondary centers appears at about puberty and fuse by the 20th year. One important applied aspect of the scapula is associated with the transverse scapular ligament which bridges the suprascapular notch. This transverse scapular ligament might sometimes be ossified. If this is ossified, then the suprascapular notch is converted into a bony suprascapular foramen. In those cases, there can be entrapment neuropathy of the suprascapular nerve. We know that the suprascapular nerve supplies the supraspinatus muscle and the supraspinatus muscle is the initiator of the movement of abduction in the shoulder joint. As a result, if there is entrapment neuropathy of the suprascapular nerve, the initiation of abduction becomes difficult. So guys, that's all about the scapula. Stay tuned to Anatomy Weekly. Keep watching, keep learning. We'll see you next time. Thank you.